between Israel, its Arab, its Arab neighbors, and and uh, Iran, and becomes destabilized. Uh, and so, so it's not only a a judicial crisis, a crisis for Israel's democracy, but it's uh, they said a national security crisis as well. And 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 Israel's former security chiefs, head of Mossad, the head of Shin Bet. The head of the Israel Atomic Energy Commission, who, who never speaks in public, public a fellow named uh, Aviv Sneer, probably never heard of him before, but he's the keeper of the of the crown jewels uh, of Israel's nuclear capabilities. Uh, he penned a long public letter to Prime Minister Netanyahu, warning of the dire, his words, dire uh, threat to Israel's existence. Uh, that this this effort uh, at judicial uh, restructuring uh, was causing. So it's a deeply alarming and concerning uh, development. And how should the United States administration respond? Well, it's uh, I think quite clear and, and straightforward. The prime minister, the president, Joe Biden, who's who's a true friend of Israel and old-style Zionist, needs to call up his friend of 40 years, Bibi Netanyahu, and say, Bibi, um, this is affecting not just the values, the common values which underpin the U.S.-Israel relationship, but it's affecting America's strategic interests in the region. You know, he, should, he should say to Netanyahu the simple truth, that he's preoccupied with the Ukraine and the Russian aggression there and Chinese assertiveness in Asia, and he's depending on Israel to maintain stability in the Middle East, not just with the Palestinians, but vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And, and this is what he's doing uh, in the judicial area is, is destabilizing. Uh, and, and he needs to back off uh, to hold up the vote, uh, to have a cooling off period in which both sides can sit down and, and and try to come up with a consensus under the auspices of President Bush. He heard so, for instance, put it put a plan out there, and 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 see if they can can resolve it. Um, but this head strong and headlong effort uh, to push the legislation through is causing a. a, a a, a crisis in Israel, the likes of which we have never seen before in its 75 year history. Yeah. So I'm sure that members of our, our audience will have their own questions about this. I will ask you one more and then I'll return to the book. Do you think that the uh, Gallant speech last night, Defense Minister Gallant and, and Netanyahu's firing of him today, is there any possibility in your judgment that this could perhaps lead to a defection of enough? members of the Likud that the government could fall? Well, uh, there was certainly three uh, votes. Netanyahu has a, uh, has a majority of 64. That, so four, at least four uh, members of, the, of his government would have to vote against it. Also, uh, I'm not sure what happens if they abstain, whether the four is enough, but if we count the numbers, there's Gallant. He's still a member of Knesset, even though he's been fired. There's Yuli Edelstein, the head of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee, who supports Gallant. There's David Bitan, who also... So that's three. The fourth was uh, expected to be Avi Dikta, who is now the Minister of Agriculture, the former head of the Sh uh, Shabak, the Shin Bet, uh, but it looks like Netanyahu is going to appoint him defense minister. And in that way, by his vote, uh, there's Danny Danon. People will remember him as uh, Israel's UN ambassador. He's also called for a freeze. It's not clear where he stands. Uh, and of course, it's, it's not clear where others will stand in a situation of, of such crisis, whether they'll decide that they too think it's, it's essential uh, to pull back and and to find a way to to um, uh, engage in a, in a dialogue and try to reach a consensus instead of this confrontational approach that the prime minister is following. 
Um, yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm sure that there will be more questions from the audience. Uh, but with this in mind, and uh, it is incredibly interesting to hear you draw comparisons between um, the current situation and the the situation that uh, Secretary Kissinger had to navigate through in 1973. And so just going back to that time and to the pages of your book, um, and there's so much rich material in there, there's no way we can get through all of it. But I wanted to just uh, ask um, the following. You remind us in the book that um, Watergate, the Watergate scandal was reaching a peak in October of 1973. And in fact, the Saturday Night Massacre, if I have my date correct, was around the 20th, 24th or so of October, um, right in the in the middle of the most intense period of the war. Nixon distracted, of course, with Watergate. So who was running the United States foreign policy? Who was running the government itself at that time? Was it Kissinger or Nixon or both? Well, as you said, Steve, Nixon was was uh, in in the throes of Watergate, um, and uh, things had grown so bad in the midst of this the Yom Kippur War uh, for him that he basically wasn't functioning, uh, and and uh, the archival records show that at the critical moment when uh, Leonard Brezhnev, uh, on behalf of the Soviet Politburo, threatened to send military forces into uh, the Sinai uh, to break Israel's hold on the Egyptian Third Army, uh, that Kissinger, uh, Schlesinger, the Defense Secretary, Alexander Haig, who was the White House Chief of Staff, uh, and the other members of the National Security Council uh, met uh, and decided to put uh, US forces around the world on what's known as a DEFCON 3 alert, uh, which alerts all of America's nuclear forces. Uh, and uh, they, they moved uh, three aircraft carrier group battle groups into the eastern Mediterranean. They put the 82nd Airborne uh, quick reaction force uh, on alert, the uh, forces in Europe as well. Um, uh, I mean, uh, this was a, a major uh, mobilization designed as a, as a signal that the United States would, would block the Soviet Union if it tried to intervene militarily. Uh, and that was all done while while Nixon was was drunk and had retired to bed, and they had a discussion whether they should should alert Nixon, and Haig said, uh, "No, it, you know, let's let's leave it." So they decided to do this without the President of the United States uh, approval, and uh, of course, in the aftermath, the next morning, Nixon gave a press conference in which he. Uh, he claimed uh, that he was in charge and uh, given the instructions. And they say, in fact, he was in bed. Now, the, the, the ultimate irony of this is that Leonard Brezhnev was out of action too. And the threat that had been conveyed, that was conveyed by the Politburo, but there's evidence in, in these uh, Russian archives that, that he had taken to bed uh, because of exhaustion, but presumably it was uh, was drunk too on on vodka, and uh, that the Politburo had, had sent off this threat without his approval. So we got the two leaders of, of the Western and Soviet world uh, both out of action, with uh, uh, a, a, a a crisis in in superpower relations that could have quite easily uh, escalated to, to all out conflict. Uh, I'm gonna um, ask a couple of questions here and these will be my last questions because I know we have many, many questions from the audience and just take these however you want ambassador. Um, the first is um, you mentioned peacemaking and your interest in peace. 
making that arose when you were a student at the Hebrew University in 1973. But in the book, and here I'm going to push you a little bit, in the book, you indicate that 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 uh, Kissinger's focus was not necessarily on achieving peace, but more sort of a form of Bismarckian stability, stability in the region, a non-war as opposed to kind of a kumbaya, everybody hugging each other and having a, a, a peaceful relations. Um, and so if you can comment on that a little bit uh, and tell us how, again, that relates to the current dynamic in the region. And then uh, for me, what, one of the most fascinating uh, uh, parts of the book are the personalities that you bring to life, uh, uh, particularly Kissinger's relationships with uh, Anwar Sadat and Hafez al-Assad, Kissinger's relationships, perhaps more, more testy relationships with Yitzhak Rabin and Golda Meir. Uh, you tell a great story about um, Kissinger having his arms crossed and and being angry during a toast that Robin gave at um, uh, a state dinner at the White House, uh, as well as the role of some lesser known figures like uh, the former Israeli ambassador to Washington at the time, Simcha Dinitz, uh, some of the uh, Egyptian high command who were in somewhat of a, 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 a tension with Sadat because they couldn't really see his grand vision. And for me, at least <clears throat> at the end, uh, where I came out, maybe this maybe this was not where you wanted me to come out, but where I came out was that Kissinger and Sadat seemed to really, really hit it off in a way that no, no other combination of people in the book did. And so if you can comment on those two aspects, and then I think that Professor Hecht will take over and, and um, uh, ask you some of the questions from our audience. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, that's two big questions. Um, uh, and. Uh try to deal with them briefly. The first is, is really what I learned uh, from the study of Kissinger's diplomacy, that his approach to peacemaking was uh, informed by a deep skepticism about the possibility that states in conflict could actually end their conflict and, and achieve peace. Uh, that the more natural state of affairs from his study of history was his view that the more natural state of affairs was one in which it was possible to ameliorate conflict, uh, but to try to resolve it was more likely to, to achieve the opposite of peace, that is to say war. And and his study of history and, and his experience, uh, particularly with the you know the peace to end all peace, the the uh, Versailles settlement after the First World War, which led to the Second World War, and the appeasement in the lead up to the Second World War, which which you know, led led to uh, the conflict with uh, Hitler, uh, were perfect examples of of why he was so, so skeptical. Of course, we have a more recent example in the uh, Arab-Israeli context of, of the effort that we made under President Clinton to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at what's known as Camp David II, which uh, uh, resulted in the Intifada. Um, and, and so his approach was to be very cautious and to try to uh, make progress by what he called step-by-step -step diplomacy, a diplomacy of small incremental steps rather than an effort to jump to a resolution of the conflict through final status negotiations. And, and that's what distinguishes him from all of us who came after him, um, because because we, and, and I say we, I mean, Nixon wanted, wanted to end the conflict in one go, Ford did, all of the, the presidents essentially since then, uh, from Bill Clinton, Barack Obama to, to Donald Trump, all tried to resolve the conflict 
Uh, whereas uh, Kissinger's approach was just to take pieces of it. So that's why he did a two disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt, a disengagement agreement between Israel and Syria. The disengagement agreement between Israel and Syria is, is the perfect example of what he had in mind. That agreement has lasted now for almost 50 years and has made the Golan Heights the most peaceful of Israel's borders. Uh, and, and yet it's not, there's no peace agreement. There's no final resolution of that, which would involve Israel uh, giving up all of the Golan Heights to Syria to achieve peace. But yet it's a stable uh, arrangement. So I think that that is, is uh, an approach that Rabin, it's like Rabin adopted in the Oslo Accords. People forget that the Oslo Accords said nothing about a Palestinian state or Jerusalem or refugees. It didn't deal with the final status issues. It dealt with a step-by-step -step process of Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and then after that three-stage step-by-step process was eventually completed, then there'd be final status negotiations. But uh, that process was never completed because uh, Ehud Barak, when he became prime minister, came to Washington and, and said to Clinton, let's end it. Let's go for a final peace deal. And Clinton said, fine. He was in his last year in office. He decided to go for it. Arafat said, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to resolve this conflict, to end it. We need to just stick with the step-by-step -step process. And uh, they wouldn't listen to him. They slept into Camp David. They tried to impose a very generous offer of peace on him. Uh, but he refused, and, and, and the whole thing blew up in our faces. And Intifada that lasted five years killed thousands of Palestinians and Israelis and destroyed all the trust and made it impossible to, to uh, achieve a, a peace between Israel and the Palestinians. So in terms of what we need to do now, it's, it's to go back to the Kissingerian approach. We need an approach of small steps, which is basically what the Biden administration is trying to do now, is to get some small conference building steps taken. But the one thing they're not doing is the one thing that Kissinger would have insisted on, which is that there has to be a territorial component to the process. It has to be some territorial withdrawal from the 60% of the West Bank that Israel now controls. And unfortunately, we have a government in Israel that would not countenance that under any circumstances. So it's very difficult to see how you could relaunch the process in a, in a way that could meaningfully lead us to peace. And so we're left with just trying to calm things down, uh, which I, I'm afraid is not likely to work. And then if you could comment on the personalities, if, you, if you're if you so inclined. Sure. Um, so uh, I think your your point about Sadat is a, is a very good one. As, as the book shows, um, Sadat was, was always two steps ahead of Kissinger. Because as I explained, Kissinger approached it with this deep skepticism about peace, whereas Sadat was a visionary who really wanted to make peace. Uh, he was committed to it. And so uh, essentially he was he was leading Kissinger. Uh, and Kissinger was trying to catch up with him. And so so uh, part of the, the story of this is this just is a fascinating story about how, how Sadat um, brought Kissinger along to, to making peace. In the end, uh, Kissinger told Sadat that he wasn't prepared to go for the final deal that Sadat wanted to make for all the reasons we've been discussing. And, and uh, it was Jimmy Carter who came after Kissinger, who in the fashion that I describe of presidents wanting to go for the final deal, went for the deal the Israel-Egypt peace deal, he succeeded. 
Uh, but he only succeeded because of the steps that Kissinger had taken. When I asked Kissinger whether he ever regretted not making the peace between Israel and Egypt that Kissinger had made two years after he left office, and Kissinger said to me in typical fashion, no, if I had uh, remained as Secretary of State, if Ford had been re-elected, I would have gone for another step. I would not have gone for the peace deal. It would have been a non-belligerency deal. Um, so even, you know, in the end, Sadat, uh, did not uh, convince him to go for it. Uh, that was left to to a later uh, uh, era, two years later. I think. So um, the, on the other side, you've got Golda Meir. And Golda Meir uh, was, uh, like Kissinger, deeply sceptical of, of Sadat, of the Arabs in general, and deeply sceptical of the idea that, that Israel should give up any territory uh, for peace with the Arabs. So Kissinger uh, had a hell of a job convincing her to take these small steps that he had in mind of, of territorial withdrawal. And he was able to do so. And I described this in the book, the amazing interaction between Golda and Sadat, and, uh, excuse me, Golda and Kissinger, in which he convinces her not to swap territory for peace which he didn't believe in, but rather territory for time. Time for Israel to grow stronger with American support, time for Israel to reduce its isolation, and most importantly, time for the Arabs eventually to come to terms with Israel. The Abraham Accords is a good example of Kissinger's sense of time. It took them 40 years for the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco to be prepared to normalize its relations with Israel. And they weren't even in conflict with Israel. Um, so, so that was the kind of timeline that Kissinger had in mind. Uh, but he persuaded Goldman that it was worth doing, that buying time could help uh, Israel uh, strengthen itself and deal with its challenges. And it, it, he did such a good job that territory for time became the foundational basis of Israel's approach to the peace process. Swapping all of Sinai to hold on to the West Bank, for example, or Sharon giving up Gaza to hold on to the West Bank. Uh, but in the main, to hold on to the West Bank in the sense of using time to settle in the West Bank. When Kissinger left office, there were 1,500 settlers in the West Bank. Today, there are 560,000 and and uh, it seems all, almost inconceivable that, that Israel would withdraw from the West Bank. But it only was able to achieve that by giving up territory in other, in other places, and including in the West Bank, where it gave up 40%. Um, and you could say that, you know, ultimately, Kissinger's uh, success had the ironic effect of making peace between Israel and the Palestinians even more difficult. Uh, and that was not his intention. Uh, Ambassador, we have a question, I think, uh, that might um, be very interesting. Uh, this questioner asks, um, Ambassador, as someone who has been in the room where it happens and has seen the progression of the Democratic Party, why is the Zionist argument losing in democratic circles, particularly on campuses like ours? So I'm not uh, on your campus or any other campus. I uh, follow it from afar. And uh, I uh, uh, am uh, deeply concerned at the way in which uh, Israel is, is being pilloried uh, on, on American campuses. Um, just anecdotally, uh, when I was a student, which was a hell of a long time ago, in the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, in Australia, down under, all that way, we had the same problem. Uh, so it's not that new. Uh, Israel as a country that has occupied uh, territory 
uh, of another country, in the case of uh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and that has uh, occupied the Palestinians uh, now for for over 50 years, for over 53 years, uh, is portrayed in, in by the left as an occupying uh, power. Uh, and there, there is in that, seen through that lens, uh, there is a greater sympathy uh, for the occupied than the occupier, uh, meaning uh, greater sympathy for the Palestinians than, than for Israel. Uh, and the fact that Israel gave up all of Sinai, gave up some of the Golan Heights, gave up 40% of the West Bank, as I said before, uh, doesn't affect that argument because it's still in occupation uh, of the West Bank uh, in the sense that its military still operates in that 40% that it gave over to the Palestinian Authority. And uh, as, as a consequence, it's portrayed in that way as, as an occupying power. And its efforts to make peace are either uh, forgotten, dismissed, or not known about uh, and whatever Israel has done in the past, it cannot make up for that perception of Israel as an occupying power. And uh, in the 21st century, it's, you know, <laughs> it's a bad comparison, but it's one that the left inevitably makes that, you know, we're, we're supporting Ukraine against uh, an uh, uh, Russian occupying power in, in eastern Ukraine that act, launched a war of aggression and, and is occupying there and it's unacceptable according under you know international law and norms uh, to occupy another uh, another country by force. The way Israel got there is not known, is not understood. Uh, what's, what's seen is that Israel is the occupying power and so I'm afraid that that is that is the, just a reality. When Ariel Sharon withdrew unilaterally from the Gaza Strip, the, the, the man who had been pilloried by the left as a, uh, a war criminal uh, and, and uh, because of his involvement in the Shabra uh, Shatila a massacre he's overseeing of uh, Israeli troops during that massacre in the 1982 Israel Lebanon war. He used, you know, he was he was treated as a war criminal until he gave up Gaza, and then he was treated as a hero in the international community. He came to the UN General Assembly, and all, and suddenly uh, Sharon was was uh, the great hero because he gave up territory which was something that Kissinger understood completely and why he said there had to be a peace process in which Israel was giving up territory, even if it didn't give up all of the territory. It had to be seen to be in the process of ending the occupation, even though that might take a long period of time. And unfortunately, the situation now is one in which Israel as a government not only is not going to end the occupation, but is busily, you know, its its finance minister and minister in the defense ministry, Bezalel Smotrich, is is out there declaring there's no such thing as a Palestinian people. And in not only is the West Bank ours, but he's standing in front of a map that shows Jordan is part of Israel as well. Um, and, and so um, when you've got a government now, uh, uh, that that involves far right extremist uh, ministers who who have a, a, a very extreme view uh, and want to annex all of the territory rather than withdraw from part of it. You've got circumstances that are made to measure for for the left to to charge that Israel's uh, involved in in a never ending occupation and the promotion of a uh, system of apartheid in, in the West Bank. I have another question. Um, Ambassador, one of the highlights of the book 
is your imagery in describing the situation rooms in which Kishin Kissinger visited. Tell us, what was the situation like in your interviewing process with Kissinger? And what was the book writing process like? Well, um, I had the advantage of uh, having access to all of Kissinger's official papers um, that they're actually available to anybody now in the National Archives and in the Yale Library. Um, just as a, a, as a footnote uh, here, Richard, um, when Kissinger left office, he took all of his documents with him, hundreds of boxes, classified, almost all of them classified. Um, and he walked out with them. I guess he put them in a big truck and took them to his lawyers. They, they had it under lock and key um, in a vault, but uh, been in there. But, uh, you know, it kind of puts in perspective uh, the documents crisis that, that we're dealing with in the case of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, he left copies, by the way, <laughs> which I guess uh, Donald Trump didn't do. Uh, but, but they're all now available. And so I could go through the, the record. And then uh, after I wrote each chapter, I would sit down with Kissinger and, and talk to him about it. Um, he's in his 90s now. He's actually about to turn 100, believe it or not. But he still remembers details of what happened in, in those days. And so it was very useful to have the written record of all of his negotiations and conversation uh, and then sit down with the man himself and, and, and discuss it. Um, and, and that, uh, I think, uh, makes the book somewhat unique uh, in, in that regard. I also had access to the Israeli archives um, and, and that uh, enabled me to kind of check the record with how the Israelis were, were viewing their and, and reporting their conversations with, with Kissinger. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, the process of writing it was, was one in which I uh, put a smile on my face every day uh, that I worked on it because I was engaged in a forensic exercise to figure out what Henry Kissinger was up to. Uh, why did I have to do that? It was because Kissinger himself in his memoirs uh, was uh, engaged in something that he did while in office, which was obfuscation. Uh, he operated in an anti-Semitic White House and an anti-Israel State Department when he became Secretary of State. And so he was constantly disguising what he was up to. Uh, and and uh, it was only when you get to go through all of the documents that you see, in fact, what what he was up to. Uh, so so that, that exercise was, uh, for me, uh, fascinating. And I, uh, oftentimes writing books can be a painful process, as I'm sure you can attest. But for me, this was a joy. It was, uh, it was uh, constantly, I would put my pen down and say, son of a gun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what he was really up to. And then I could go and check it with him. Sometimes he, he said he didn't remember. Sometimes he genuinely didn't remember. But at other times he would admit that, that in fact, it was, it was uh, my account was accurate. Noah, uh, Noah Weiss, who has uh, been closely reading Master of the Game this quarter, anticipating your visit, uh, has another question that he, he'd like to ask. He says, Ambassador, do you think Kissinger loved Golda Meir? Um, you write <laughs> that he thought of her like an aunt. Tell us, did Kissinger realize that he was such he was such a formative historical figure, and that the relationship was so important? Well, he didn't love Golda. I think he probably had a love hate relationship with Golda. Um, and it was it was more complicated than that. Uh, Kissinger himself was complicated. 
um, I think the relationship is one one more like a a, a wayward nephew. I think as Drew at one point described <laughs> himself that way, in which she would kind of um, uh, engage in in things that Jewish mothers are really good at, which is guilt trips. I mean, he would she would constantly uh, try to, to um, guilt him into uh, doing things. Um, and sometimes it worked very well. Uh, the uh, most uh, interesting example of that was after uh, he had negotiated the ceasefire in the Yom Kippur War, he flew into Israel uh, to try to explain to Golda why he hadn't consulted with her before reaching an agreement with Brezhnev in Moscow uh, to reach a ceasefire, uh, which was in effect uh, uh, imposed on Israel. Uh, and he expected her to be very upset with him. In fact, on the, in the car ride from the airport with Abu Eban, who was the foreign minister at the time, he said to Abu Eban, is Golda furious at me? And so he goes into this meeting expecting to get scolded, scolded, what's the word? Scolded, not and, and scolded in the sense of being burnt. Um, and she instead thanks him for all that he did to help Israel get the weapons it needed um, to turn the tide of battle. And his heart goes out to her. She is completely devastated by the casualties that, and, and her sense of responsibility for it. And so he says to her, you know, I'm really sorry that I didn't consult you <laughs> about, about the ceasefire. And if you need a little bit more time, uh, go ahead. You know, I won't get home uh, for another 24 hours. And uh, essentially, he said, you can use that time uh, to advance your positions. And... Um, he actually kind of gave them a, Israel a green light to continue the war after the ceasefire that he had negotiated with the Soviets uh, went into place. That was a classic example of Kissinger feeling guilty in his relationship with, with Golden. And it, it nearly led to nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States because Brezhnev thought that Kissinger had betrayed him when Israel used the time that he gave them to surround the Egyptian Third Army and, and uh, uh, put itself in a position to force the surrender of the Egyptian Third Army, which uh, uh, the Soviet Union was not prepared to tolerate uh, because it was done after the ceasefire went into effect. So, so uh, on the other hand, when it came to the effort to convince Golda to give up territory, Kissinger was prepared to be very tough with her. And I, I outlined this in, in uh, the book. They had a knockdown, drag out fight in which Kissinger, presenting himself as a, as a friend of Israel, ever, you know, argued that. Um, it was in Israel's interest to give up territory. And if it didn't do so, it was going to be in serious trouble. And not just with the Soviet Union and with the Arabs, but with the United States as well. Uh, and he, fin he finally convinced her, as I was explaining uh, before. Uh, but uh, it, it was a, uh, a, a very difficult um, uh, conversation. And it, you were referring earlier to photographs, there's a beautiful photograph there of Kissinger and, and Golda uh, in the midst of their battle, they called in the press to do a photo op and you can see the two of them are just kind of uh, uh, in, a, in a both of them are in, in foul moods So uh, I, you know, I know the answer to this because I've read the book but the title that you chose Master of the Game suggests um, a unique view of how you place Kissinger in the history of American diplomacy, say in the 20, 20th century. Tell us about how you came up with that title. And ultimately, I think 
how you think Kissinger will be remembered in the second half of the 20th century? So uh, Kissinger didn't like the book uh, when I showed him the first, I uh, showed him two chapters in draft form just just because I felt that I, I owed him. He, he'd been so generous with his time, I owed him some sense of, of what, what I was doing. And uh, so I gave him the two best chapters uh, for him, I mean, he painted him in the best light because the other chapters I'm very critical of him. And uh, after he read it, he called my wife, who, who used to work for him, and told him that he never wanted to talk to me again. Uh, so he was uh, very upset about it. Eventually, he calmed down and he got on the phone with me and spent an hour explaining to me what he objected in the book. And what he objected to was that it made him look manipulative. Um, but of course, that was the whole point of study is diplomacy, because the art of diplomacy is the art of manipulation. It's the art of, of persuading uh, leaders to go to places they'd rather not go. Um, and uh, one definition of diplomacy is uh, the art of, of telling a, a leader to go to hell and making him want to go there. Um, and, and so Kissinger uh, was the master of that game. He was the master manipulator. That's why I chose that title. Uh, so after this one hour of, of fetching about the book, um, I, I finally said to him, look, Henry, I think you'll like the title. He says, what's that? I said, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. And then there's this long pause on the other end of the line. And then he says to me, well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so, um, so, um, yeah, so that, that's where I came on the title. You know, I, I have, I've been thinking as about Steve's question to you at the beginning. If How do you think Kissinger would go about diplomatically helping the situation in Israel today? What would he do if you could imagine him being in a position of, of maybe whispering in Biden's ear, what what would he yeah. do? Yeah. Uh, Richard, I, I, I just, before I answer the question, I just want to uh, ask if it's okay if we can make this the last question. Because yes, yes. I know we started late, but unfortunately, I've certainly back to back today because of what's going on in Israel. Certainly. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so, as I show in the book, Kissinger was keenly aware of the fragility of Israel and acted in all sorts of ways that were not clear uh, to the public to help Israel and to strengthen Israel and to give Israel uh, all the military advantages that, that would enhance its deterrence um, and design the peace process in a way that would be digestible politically for Israel, these small territorial steps, rather than expecting Israel to withdraw fully from territory it had occupied. All of that was, was because of Kissinger's sense of the fragility of Israel, the political fragility of Israel. Uh, and so what's happening today uh, is something that he is not surprised by. Um, he's very, very aware of the way in which internal conflicts in Israel, which have been suppressed for so long, can suddenly erupt because of external pressures or political changes. Uh, and he would regard this as deeply problematic for the United States. This is what I, I, I was saying earlier. 
uh, because the United States needs a, a strong Israel, not only to be able to defend itself by itself, but also to be able to stabilize the order in the region by deterring uh, attacks on it, uh, whether it be deterring another intifada with the Palestinians or deterring Iran from crossing the nuclear threshold. And when Israel is divided internally in such a profound way as we're witnessing at the moment, its deterrence is undermined. And for Kissinger, that's where he lives. He lives with the balance of power being the critical means of, of maintaining order, a balance of power that's tipped in Israel's favor against any of its enemies through the support of the military assistance of the United States. So I think they would be telling Biden, uh, you've got to do something to get Prime Minister Netanyahu to back away from this because it's damaging to Israel, but it's also damaging to the United States. Ambassador, thank you. And, and before I formally thank you, I want to thank uh, Steve Zipperstein, um, who is in London at the present time. He's on his way to The Hague, where he's going to be talking about um, uh, the international law in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to the Hague in Initiative for International Cooperation. Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Ambassador Indic, let me thank you again for your coming and visiting. And I'm very sorry that we had a bit of a delay at the beginning, um, but it was a pleasure to see you. And just as you were a decade ago, when you first visited, um, your commentary is incredibly incisive and helpful. And it's a pleasure to see what extraordinary people we have in the diplomatic corps and what they have contributed um, to the United States and to the countries where they have been serving. Thank you very, very much. And I encourage all of you to go to our uh, favorite bookstore, Chaucer's, and purchase this incredible book um, by uh, Ambassador Indic, um, Master of the Game. Um, you will enjoy every page of it. Perhaps you're thinking already of Passover gifts to bring, take Master of the Game, and maybe even buy yourself another copy for summer reading. So Ambassador Indic, thank you very, very much for joining you, us Richard. this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, and my apologies again for for the delay and and I'm very grateful to you for hosting me and thank you Steve it must be very late for you so thanks again for for doing this it's very good to see you great pleasure yeah, ambassador thank you so much thank you thank you all the best bye. to you all bye everyone bye, bye.